Hello, and welcome back to a brand new season of The Art of SBA Lending. Can you believe we've been doing this for four years? And we took the summer off, so we're well rested, and we want to take things to the next level. You know, fresh content, different formats, really try to innovate this thing, and of course, interview some of the top talent in the SBA lending industry. So I'm excited to kick things off. We just recorded uh, five episodes in Deerfield, which came out really great. Hey, Bruce Bodie, what are you doing here? Well, you know, I decided you've been doing this podcast, doing so well, interviewing some great guests in the SBA world. I decided we're going to turn the tables now. We're going to interview you. So I'm here to interview you. You want to interview me. I want to interview you because people want to hear what you have to say. Can I at least put some pants on first? Please do. So I've been in lending for 12 years, and you guys know I'm all about speed. So I'm going to give all you BDOs out there a pro tip. One of the biggest cogs in the process is getting the borrower to send you the underwriting package. And the last items that they send are always the business plan and projections because it's the most time intensive. So they save it for last, but that delays the process. The small business owners I know, they don't want to sit in front of their computer all day. They want to go run their business. And so that's why I send them to rapid business plans right out of the gate. They make it easy for entrepreneurs to tell their story in a format bankers love. They can help with the business plan projections and assumptions and turn it around in as little as four business days. Just yesterday, I had an ITL deal come across my desk, and I sent them straight to Rapid Business Plans because that export business plan is essential to my 90% guarantee, and I want to make sure it's done right. And guess what? The cost can count towards their equity injection because I'm going to build it into the project. It's a no-brainer. Now, I have one last tip. If you don't do startups, well, now you do. Feasibility studies tell you if the borrower's business idea is going to work. And in my experience, can give the bank the added comfort needed to get to a yes. And Rapid Business Plans offers these as well. So go to rapidbusinessplans.com and set up a get acquainted call. I'll leave a link in the show notes below. Well, this is weird. This is very weird. <laughs> this is very weird. It's weird to be. So I'm going to drive the train today. That's right. And so I'm turning the tables. I'm going to ask you questions. All right. Well, I'll, uh, we'll see. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, it's going to be different. I've been interviewed before, so hopefully I'm just not going to mess it up. You're going to be great, man. You're going to be great. I'll, I'll get you there. So I'm all my experience podcasting and interviewing and all that good, good stuff. Well, you, you know what? You moderated a session at Flagle like five years ago or something like that, maybe four. And it was so well moderated that um, I've been telling people for years how good of a moderator. I don't know how good of a lender you are, but um, <laughs> moderator, you're excellent. And uh, so I feel like I'm definitely in good hands. All right. Good deal. Uh, better moderator than lender. Let's get that out of the way. So let's do this. I want to start, I want to start with a little bit of, a little bit of you um, in the early days. So uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Boca. Elementary school, middle school, high school, all in Boca. I was born in New York, New York, but we we moved down young, and um, I went to UCF for college um, in Orlando, and then you know a, a couple of years after that, I moved back down closer to uh, back down here. And I'm now I'm living in Boynton, obviously in your neck of the woods, you know, two towns up from Boca. But yeah, down so, here. So a local boy then. Yeah, you could say that. Almost born, well, definitely raised, not quite born, but a local boy. Right, right, right. Good. What activities were you uh, involved in growing up? Not much. I Video games, TV, uh, playing cards, um, some nerdy stuff. Okay. Things like that. Kind of getting prepared for the whole podcasting thing. Uh, this is like a video game, kind of, only, uh, only a little bit different. I would say... Uh, if you would have told me I was going to host anything or be outgoing or anything like that, I would definitely say no. I was pretty shy. There were some instances where I would like, I, I when I felt comfortable, I would definitely be more funny and like act out. But in like 80% of my classes in high school, I was pretty reserved and wouldn't even, I wouldn't talk at all. So, so no, I don't think I was preparing to be a talk show host. <laughs> <laughs> so after UCF, uh, what did you do? 
Well, in my last semester at UCF, I took an internship and it was marketing because I was a marketing major and we were stuffing envelopes and uh, database cleanup and random stuff like that. And I left the internship and I had no idea what the company did. I just knew they were paying me, you know, seven fifty an hour. And that was what I needed at the time to pay for my, you know, my, my fun activities in college. And so um, turns out they were an SBA 504 lender, interim lender. And they had called me about a month after graduation, which was 2011. So economy was pretty rough. And I remember exactly where I was when they offered me the job and who, who was on the call. And um, I was like, yeah. And I had just accepted a job selling printers, like <laughs> office printers. And uh, I, I reneged on that acceptance to, to go do this because this, this felt more right. So let me make sure I understand. So you were in college, you were doing this internship, doing marketing type activities, but didn't know who you were working for, didn't know really what they did. And then they offered you a job and you decide to take it. Yeah. I thought it was something with like apartment buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my questions was going to be, how did you find your way to the SBA world? But you just answered that. So what did you do for that company? What was your first job? Well, they had um, this thing where, um, I don't know if any of these names will ring a bell to anyone, but uh, Dan Eschbaugh was a sales trainer at GE Capital. I know and Dan. Chris Hearn was the CEO of Mercantile Capital, and Chris um, hired Dan to call on all of the commercial real estate offices in the country, Lee & Associates, Collier's, Grubb & Ellis, things like that, and give them free sales training. And then in the middle of the four-hour sales training or whatever it was, Tony Zara, who's now at New Tech, one of the guys who taught me you know, how to do this, he would come in in the middle and do a, a commercial 15 minutes on 504s. So we had thousands of people, uh, brokers, that we had accumulated um, contact info for that were kind of sending us business. But, you know, um, they wanted me to go in there and call them and be like, hey, just following up. You know, you had this. Tony was in there two months ago talking about 504s. We just wanted to see if you had any deals coming across your desk. And my goal was to basically call 100 commercial real estate brokers a day. So that was nice. one half of my job. Nice. And then the other half was just responding to inbound kind of lead flow from the company. Okay. How'd you like it? I liked it. I mean, cold calling, it's pretty rough, I feel like. Uh, I By the end of it, I loved it because it's like you figure out a way to make it work. You know, it's almost like, okay, I just did 10 cold calls. Boom. That's another 10. Boom. Work on my scripts. I got to make my own scripts, so I try to do it in my own voice and you know, people hang up on you and that doesn't feel good. But, but when you get a deal, uh, from somebody after a hundred cold calls, that feels equally as good as that felt bad. So it's just like kind of set me up for the extreme highs and lows of a BDO. <laughs> but I liked that. I mean, sir, you know, responding to people that were incoming, it was more friendly. So that was probably something I enjoyed better because you're just getting, you're trying to help people and you're giving them information that they're seeking so, I mean, I remember liking it, especially just being there in the office and liking everyone I was working with. I just remember loving that whole job. How do you feel like the cold calling set you up for success down the road? Uh, yeah, it's just one of those things, kind of like how like people I did like Cutco knife selling, like it just <laughs> kind of like, yeah, builds grit. And um, it basically makes you, it made me understand. And by the way, I was reading a lot of books at the time and applying it towards what I was doing. And, you know, the psychology of selling and things like that. So I was taking it as this is my new craft and how can I be the best at it? And when you do a cold call, it, it's just it teaches you you can create something from nothing. And I like that. Good answer. I like that grit, too. That's that's something that you can't uh, that, that you that you can build through those kinds of um you know, character building, cold calling type activities. So that's fantastic. You mentioned um, a couple of people early on that kind of uh, maybe helped you get your way into the industry. Did you have any, any uh, who, who were some mentors or role models that you kind of used to help you as you, as you moved into the, the, uh, the, the kind of the outside sales BDO type role? Well, first I had built my foundation over at that company for two years and there was 
I mean, everyone helps you when you're in, you're all in an office together, um, which is different than today. Um, but it's like you can just go to anyone's office and get help. So I remember Sean Philly, who's at New Tech also, he was the one that kind of really taught me how to even read a tax return. So I look over his shoulder and, I, and he's pointing, you know, depreciation. And I'm learning it like just that way. And um, there were f- essentially four loan officers there that taught me. They were very generous. There was a initial guy that trained me, um, but then there was also the CEO, Chris, who, you know, brought me in and gave me the opportunity. Um, And the only reason I left was because I saw this sign in a bank branch that was being built out and it just said SBA lenders wanted. And I was like, I didn't know up until that point that this was a career or a job. So I called the number out of pure, like, curiosity And they ended up hiring me as a BDO. I made the decision to go out on my own and build it on my own. And at that point, I didn't really have any resources now that I think about it other than my direct manager. Um, And I had really two main managers there that, you know, because sometimes there's turnover in our industry. Sometimes. (laughs) um, But but like uh, they were both my mentors early on. One that gave me a 22-year-old who had never done a 7A, had zero book of business, made me a vice president at the bank, business development officer. Um, and and they just said, you know, they saw that I had like fire in the belly. It's literally what he said. It was the first time I heard the phrase. And uh, he was right. Turns out it's Tom Zernick, uh, president of, of Bay First now. And then George Andreas was after him, my sales manager, who then brought me to ReadyCap. When he found me, I was doing uh, Pete to startup deals, you know, 250K, leasehold improvements, and I was scraping together, you know, 5 million bucks of production. And then, you know, that got me to start looking more for, for CRE and larger deals and to start increasing my production. So let me repeat back what I think I just heard you say. You became a producing SBA BDO by answering a help wanted sign in a window. Is that is that what I heard you say? That is correct. Okay, nice. Very good. So just so and, and anybody who wants to do this knows that there there's always hope. There's always hope. Yeah. People ask me all the time, like, how do you crack into the industry? I was like, oh, just, yeah, just walk by a help wanted sign. <laughs> I love it. So let's talk about that for a second. So uh, how would you describe the current state um, of SBA BDO talent. You know, you got a lot, the, the way I see it is you've got a lot of, a lot of old men and women like me that have been doing this for a long time. We're jaded and, and, and just about to retire. And then you've got some, some younger guys like you and, and, and ladies like you. And, and I don't know that there's that much in the middle. So how do you see the current state of the SBA BDO? Well, the people in the middle are either going up or down towards, you know, the top, you know, if they're starting and they're in it for just a couple of years, I, I see some people that are, they're, 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 you can see that they're going to be big producers and they just haven't done it long enough. Um, but I, but I see a, a lot of people who don't, you know, they really struggle and I feel bad. And, um, because I've talked a lot on this podcast about like, I don't get it. Like why, why are low producers not producing? And, you know, I've come to realize like having a daughter now, uh, you know, six months, eight months ago, oops, the previous 11 years when I had no kids, I made my work like my kid and I put everything into it. And it's really hard to fail when you literally think about succeeding at any point if you're like brain's not if you're not talking, I'm just thinking about how to be a better BDO kind of, or like how, to, or I can, oh, I can go after this group or that and do this marketing campaign. And, you know, it's just like ideas after ideas and it's all nonstop for years and years and years. And it's like, how can, you know, especially with the resources out here, it's like, how can you not receive? But then I realize like life does get in the way sometimes and people have other things other than work. So sometimes it's just a function of that, but all in all, I'm really happy to see some really young, hungry BDOs come out here now that, you know, I'm friends with now and we, you know, they listen to the podcast and they come to my events and stuff and they're very talented. And I know people doing just insane, insane numbers. Um, but I also talk to a lot of people that do, you know, very little, uh, and, um, I can't really explain it. I can't either. So let's stay on that topic for a second. Tell me about a time you failed. 
Come on, Ray. It can't be that hard. You're not <laughs> Superman. This might have been the hardest question I've ever got. Well, you just failed at this question. There. I just gave you an answer. So one of the times um, that I failed was uh, my heart was in the right place, but I was trying to, you know, now I'm in a player coach role, so I hire BDOs. And I wanted to specifically hire a BDO that didn't have the production to, to give them the chance, just like I got, because I've always remembered how lucky I, I've been to have that opportunity to get crack into the industry. And what I come to find out is it's really hard, and I, somebody needs to crack the code, but to train some raw talent in a remote workplace setting is extremely difficult. Even with the technology, um, it's like, I told you how I learned. I was standing over someone's shoulder and I could go in people's office all day long. So that uh, experience um, kind of stuck with me now. And I'm like, I, maybe it's not possible because I failed at it. And I was like, what could I have done differently? And I don't have an answer. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So let's stay on that topic for a second. Tell me about the challenges that you've had in that player coach role. Okay. So the player coach role is a role that I would not advise anyone to take or to do. Um, and we're both sitting here in that role. I'm actually not in that role anymore. I was in that role, but not anymore. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. You're just a straight manager now? Straight manager. Okay. Straight overhead. All Dead right. weight. Check the, we'll check the record then. Okay. Um, my bad. So <laughs> it's a, it's a really tough position, really tough. Um, the first six months I was failing miserably. Um, maybe I could have said that, but, um, I figured it out, but it was also my first time managing. Um, so I, I was just really trying to figure out managing. I think that's one of the hardest things ever, but it's just like, if you're a player coach, like you have to produce. So you're like, you know, your pipeline is what you have to manage, but then you also have to manage people. And those are two of the most important things you're doing because you're managing, you know, people and then transactions that are the biggest transactions of these small business owners' lives. And it's like, how do you do both really well? Because if I was only doing one, I could do it, you know, really well. But to do both of those really tough jobs really well is hard. And so I... I'm capping myself out at three. Um, so I have two BDOs on my team. I'm looking for one more if you're interested. Um, <laughs> but that's it because I want to make sure I always have the time that, it, you know, a BDO uh, would need, you know, from their manager. Do you ever find yourself, because um, it's a pretty small sandbox, I would say, do you ever find yourself in a situation where you're on the same deal with one of your BDOs? Um, yeah, I, you know, it is a small world. Um, and you know, people run into each other in the market all the time. Uh, my response is always take it. Um, even if it's not on my team, people on my team, you know, run it, who's on a different team, you know, I'm just like, you know, run with it. I don't, you know, there's plenty to go around. I'm, I honestly, I'm, I shouldn't say this, but you know, I'm, I'm busy. So I'm sometimes I'm happy when I, when that happens. <laughs> What characteristics or traits do you think are essential for successful SBA BDO? Well, I, I can say the role itself is like, you need to be able to go out and find business. You need to know credit. And you need to be really good with people, particularly internally. And, and, and it's like kind of like the deal management. You have to be like a deal maker. It, there's a lot of things that have to come together and you have to be pretty good at all of them to be a successful BDO. I think that's why it's so hard to become a successful BDO or to find someone who can be a successful BDO because it's a lot of different, you have to be like kind of like a, you know, a Swiss army knife and have a lot of different uh, tools in the arsenal. But ultimately it has to be that same thing that like a business owner has um, where it's like, I want to build something. Um, the sky's the limit. You know, what I uh, am going to get out of this is what I, I'm going to put in and I'm going to put in everything. And if you have that type of mentality, I mean, the people doing the people doing the big numbers, this isn't a job, you know, this is their life. This is who they are and they're just putting everything into it. So you have to have that 
internal desire to be the best version of yourself as possible in the context of that's going to be a, a top producing BDO. Okay. Makes sense. So how, how do you, how does Ray Drew define success? I define success as uh, in, in the BDO role in specifically? It can be in the BDO role. It can be in life. I'm just curious to hear your perspective on what success looks like. How do you measure it? You know, what, what, what does that mean to you? You know, in life, I can't, you know, I'm 34, Bruce. I don't really know. I haven't figured out life yet. Um, all I'm trying to do right now is um, build things, you know, do my production, build, do side projects to kind of just build. I like building things. So, you know, build a course or, uh, you know, do this project or start a second podcast or, you know, whatever, things like that. I like building and then um, doing those two things in a way that keeps my life balanced with the rest of the stuff because I do have a young family now. Um, so in, for me at the start of this, this year, when I'm like talking about what I want, to, what I want this year to look like, it's basically a, uh, a, a balanced version of what I've been doing. Um, but in the BDO role, it's, you know, we measure it, you know, basically production, efficiency, and having a good reputation. Uh, essentially, like that's a successful BDO because you can get some of these things, but not all of them, but you need all of them to be successful because there's BDOs that do produce a lot that their ego starts running amok and, you know, they power they start powering stuff through in the back because they've, they've become too big to fail and that's to me that would be an absolute failure i think that makes sense i think to 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 really succeed in this role you do have to have a certain amount of ego but like you said when it gets when it runs away with you or from you is when things really start to go bad and i think i think that good reputation is something that's very much underlooked in our industry so yeah i mean i'm not i'm not the nicest i'm not the most easygoing. I'm not the most, you know, just um, back down at everyone's. There is a certain, you have to do these things, but you have to do it in a right way and you can't go past a line. So there's times, you know, you have to push back internally, but <clears throat> there's also times you have to push back externally. That's the key balance. Uh, if you're a BDO and every time there's a problem in the field with the bar or the referral source, if you just go push on your team, that's wrong. You have to have that yeah, anyway, I've talked about it on one of these episodes, like an internal compass to know, all right, here's the problem. Where do I need to go push? And 50% of the time it's internally. Are, are you sure we have to do it this way? Or, or is there any other options? And sometimes it's like, Mr. Barr, look, we told you this up front. You know, we can't be doing this. So if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've probably heard me ask countless SBA leaders about the biggest challenges that their shops face. And there's one answer that's been given over and over again, and that is we can't find enough SBA talent. And when we do find them, we can't afford them because the salaries have skyrocketed. Somewhere along the lines, banks cut their training programs, fewer people were able to enter the industry, and folks started aging out. And now our industry is facing a talent crisis. And at the same time, our industry is growing. New shops are popping up every day, and there's just not enough people to go around. Now more than ever, we need an injection of new talent, not just to process the loans, but to pull our industry forward into the future with fresh ideas. This is why Shatterbox was created. Shatterbox is resurrecting the apprenticeship to solve the talent gap in SBA lending. Shatterbox is an in-depth 12-month apprenticeship where new SBA talent can absorb the skills needed to be proficient in our business with one-on-one -on -one interaction, Fortune 100 level e-learning at their fingertips, and a round table of SBA experts on standby to provide technical assistance. If you'd like to participate, visit shatterbox.io and sign up to receive more information. It kicks off this fall and space is limited. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Now on with the show. All right, so you were, you were talking about balance, right? You have a young family now. Maybe you have more on the way, who knows? What do you do for fun outside of work? You know, I get that question a lot. And um, when I am on the weekends or at night, I dream of doing a marketing campaign. I dream of cleaning up my database, checking off my to-do list. I don't golf. I don't play pickleball. I will hang out by the pool a little bit, you know, uh, with my family. But 
my what I would really love to do is lock myself in a room and do my marketing, do my podcast, do my content creation, do my projects. I mean, that's just what I love. I don't know what to tell you. You know, I know it's a stupid, lame answer, but it's not a lame answer. It's just it's, it contradicts what you define as success because that's that's no balance to me. You're like you're working, 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 and then listen. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because that's what's made you as successful as you are now. Yeah, but you know what? We here's the thing. Like we built up. So you know, my first year at Fundex, I did 45 million. That was um, 35 units. And it was the most I had ever done. And that was the most I had ever worked in a year. And it's like, okay. So next year, I'm like, I want to do probably like 25 million because I want more balance. Well, we got more efficient, the team, because the team starts working together because we work in a pod. So it's like the team's working and and building efficiencies within the pod because you have the same underwriter, same closer on every deal. So now that, so that year, I ended up having to up my goal a couple times because I ended up doing 65 million. 44 units and it was easier than not only my last year but also the year before when I had done like or the last full year when I had done like 15 million and I was like okay so this year you know I'm kind of on that same trajectory and it's it's getting more and more efficient because you keep working with your team so I have you know more time to do these projects and and then the combined projects plus production and work and managing is, you know, a very reasonable time where I can go downstairs at 530, hang out with my daughter, make dinner, put everyone to bed, and then go back up and work maybe two nights a week for an hour. And then on the weekends, you know, it's like one day I'm not working, the other day I'm doing a couple hours in the morning. And all in all, it's probably a 50-hour work week. And I think that's like pretty much the new 40-hour work week, which is really lower than what it should be. It's like 60 to 80 is like kind of 40. Does that make sense? But I feel like 50 (laughs) is as little as any BDO is going to work if they're going to be successful. And I'm right there. And I'm doing it in a way that it's probably bigger than most people working 50 hours. Yeah, and now you're setting the bar pretty high at 50 hours. That's good. I mean, and you're and by your definition, that maybe is actually a little bit low. So that's pretty interesting. Um, one of your big projects, the Art of SBA Lending uh, podcast. How did you come up with that? Um, you know, it's funny. I should look at my notes because there was all sorts of different names that I was going to name it. I'm glad I chose this one. I like it. But I was going to go with like, it was the idea of like, one day I was going to interview the industry's greats. And I was going to call it like industry, like uh, godfathers of SBA or something like that. (laughs) And then I was like, oh, what about godmothers? And then I was like, okay, art of SBA. But ultimately what it was, you know, and I, and I've, I've said this before and I've basically told people like, uh, I wanted to go find the content to, to go be a better BDO. You know, this was 2018 is when I was had the idea. I said, oh, well, there's no podcast. I said, ah, maybe I should start the podcast because I was, I had gotten a couple trophies from being a top producer at the time. I just wanted to know how to get to 25 million, you know? And uh, a year later, I actually started the podcast and I, this was the mic I used. Um, and I just started recording. I bought it for 60 bucks. You're up and running by Monday. Super easy. The question is, why did I keep doing it? And why, why, have, why am I still doing it? You know, because in hindsight, um, it was the best decision I ever made. It's made me uh, relevant in the industry in a way that, uh, you know, there's no other way to do it. I mean, you're putting out content on LinkedIn and people are seeing your face over and over and over. So then when I go to a conference, everyone kind of already knows me. Mm -hmm. And if I were to call somebody, you know, they might uh, actually pick up. And if I want to recruit someone, they were like, oh yeah, well, you know what? I love your podcast. So uh, yeah, it's like value add. It's like, I, I will, yeah, I would love to come work for you. I mean, of course. And it's like people, when you're getting a job, it's like, oh yeah, we know who you are. And guess what? You can, I've said everything I've ever thought on this podcast. And so you can go listen to it and decide really if you think, you know, I'm a jerk or not, because I just put it all out there pretty unfiltered. And I've closed loans from people that have found the podcast. You know, borrowers will type in SBA, find my podcast, fill out my form, boom, $3 million loan. 
So the it's paid off dividends like multiple, multiple times over. But that none of that was in my head when I started. And I think the lesson there is like, you know, don't expect anything. Just do things and just provide value. Because like ultimately I was providing everything I knew to BDOs who are technically my competition. And I pivoted into interviews later on. Um, you were my, I think you were my first interview. I don't know if it was the first. It was early on though. It was I, right in the middle of COVID and yeah, maybe yeah, that was, crazy stuff. It was one of my first for sure. Um, but I, but, but that's a question I really don't know the answer to. I feel like I don't know why I'm still doing it other than um, I just don't feel like it's, Oh, I don't feel like it's reached the end. Well, I think you answered why you still do it. I mean, it's it's bringing you business, it's bringing you recognition, it's 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 putting your name out there. I mean, those are all good and providing good information for other BDOs who are technically your competition, but you're giving that freely. I think that that's exactly why you're still doing it and it makes sense. Um, what's what's next after the podcast? Well, we just started monetizing the podcast. Um, so we have two sponsors today. Uh oh, who who are this they? This episode's brought to you by <laughs> Shatterbox. Um, and I oh, and uh, I don't want to misstate it, but it's either Rapid Business Plans or Lewis Capus, the law firm. But anyway, we've been building this up for f- three and a half years at a loss. Um, a lot goes into this, um, and you know we travel all around the country. We have equipment. I have a producer, um, and. I just decided, you know, this is a legit podcast. We could have sponsors. So I reached out to 10 people that I know. And I said, do you want to sponsor the podcast? Eight said yes. I, you know, I ran out by five. So I have a waiting list. And um, I guess it's people that recognized we're, we're providing value. We're getting, we're, we're, we have the, you know, the industry is, um, you know, they're listening. And so they have decided to partner and I partner and I'm blessed to be partnering with firms that I actually use and like so i don't feel like a sellout because that's why i didn't do it for so many years so now it's just pivoting into like a legit podcast that has sponsors that is sort of like the modern day like where do you go to like figure out what's going on in the industry like this is this is it this is the only podcast you know for sba lenders and um I really enjoy doing it. I mean, it's 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 a lot of fun. Okay. That's great, man. I'm glad to hear you monetize this thing, start making some money out of it. Not that you already don't make enough doing what you do, but good for you. Yeah, cover the cost. You know, that's all I want. <laughs> Let's talk about um, some Ray Drew philosophy here for a second. So what is your motto or philosophy for success? So uh, here's what comes to me on that. Um, it starts with obviously you have to get in front of the right people. So here I have a lot of these actually. The first one is like in my BDO blueprint, it's you need to first figure out what you're selling because it's it's not money, it's not SBA loans. You need to actually figure out what you're selling. Then you need to figure out how to communicate it effectively, and then you need to do that to the right people, right? So there was countless meetings I had coming up sitting there at Panera and lunches and this and that with people that never did or never were going to send me any business. And I thought for some reason, well, I feel productive because I set up a lunch. So you need to get in front of the right people and you need to really know what you're selling and you need to do that. And then what I've done is once I've, I've done those things, um, the way I communicate it is through marketing. So I will post on LinkedIn and I will do email blasts and I will create content on YouTube and podcasts and this and that. And, and I'll even put do in-person events and I'll bring people together so that if you are in my, if you're someone I think I can add value to, um, you know, and that's key and you have to be able to provide value. Um, and, and then I, w- I, you know, wherever you look, you're going to see me and then you're going to decide when you want to do business with me. So I developed that um, approach pretty early versus like the traditional go out and sell approach. So that is um, from a business development standpoint, how I've become successful. That's literally it. And you can unravel that spider web. But then overarchingly, like there's other pillars to being a successful BDO that I also believe in. 
And there's pillars of being an SBA, a good SBA lender that I always believe in. And it's the stuff you've probably heard over and over, like, do what you say you're going to do. Oh, here's one. Answer your phone. You know, stuff like that. I mean, it's not rocket science. So let's talk about, let's shift from the individual BDO. What do you think it takes to be a successful SBA shop? There's an episode you can go find. I, and it's funny because some of the stuff I've been putting out since 2019 and I've done an episode called the I think, 10 Pillars of Success for a BDO, and I've done the 10 Pillars of Success for a shop. <clears throat> and then years will go by, and I'll go and listen. Um, I was spot on, and I say, you know what? This is a good podcast because <laughs> I like listening to it. Even I listen to it over and over again because it's like, I, you know, I I was doing this stuff for you know slightly less than a decade when I'm recording it, but I'm learning from some of the industry's best people, and then I'm putting it into a uh, into practice and I'm learning and I'm, and I'm saying it as almost like, okay, this is the lesson of the week I learned. Let me go tell it to everyone else. So it's not like it's, it's not like embedded in me at that time. So when I go back and listen, it's like reaffirming. And some of these are like, basically, I mean, I get into the weeds in this podcast and like one of them's like from the beginning term sheets, there's two schools of thoughts on term sheets. There's the phrase I've heard is let's get the deal off the street. And there's a term sheet that actually carries weight where it's like, I'm going to get the deal done. And so I gravitate towards the latter. And I think shops that are putting out term sheets and not converting a significant portion into approvals and kicking it back, declining it, or restructuring it later, I think that is dis doing a disservice to the industry because what it's been doing now is forcing borrowers to run parallel processes with multiple shops because they don't believe us anymore. Mm. So I think that's one. And I have nine more, but you know, you can go look at the episode. <laughs> you don't want to give us one more? The heart of it is basically, um, uh, let's see, you need to be flexible. I mean, every deal, the deal's going to die at least once. We're going to have to solve a, solve a problem to overcome it. So, so know that going in, don't expect perfection because these are small business owners. They've gone through a lot, um, especially if they've been in business longer. Um, I, I used to do some startups and it would be like, they, it would be like easier to get them done, even though they're riskier because they don't have a track record for you to scrutinize. Right. But I think at the core of it, it's like you need to, you, I mean, obviously, you know, everyone wants to be fast and efficient, but if you ultimately, if you do the right thing by the client and the referral source, you know, especially the referral source who's bringing you business, if that's how you're choosing to work, I mean, um, you got to do the right thing. I like it. I like it. What is, uh, what's the best advice you ever received? Uh, you're not asking any small questions today, Bruce. I wanted to make this a little bit higher level, Ray. I didn't want to, I didn't want to spend too much time in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, no, the sur on the surface. I wanted to get a little deeper. Well, I see a lot of books on your shelves. You know, book, a lot of these books are full of good advice. I've read a good many of them. I mean, that's probably the best advice is read books. Um, the, Wait, nobody does that anymore though, right? My, well, audiobooks. I always like reading. I mean, my, I've told, I've told people that it's, you know, probably the number one reason I've been successful is because of books. And it's, I mean, if you think about it, successful people telling you, you know, it's almost like their lives, like knowledge into a book and then it transfers to you. And I mean, if you think of someone who's read zero books versus a thousand books, you know, it's, it's just unfair. I mean, and my, my boss at the time, Chris Hearn, um, when I was 22 starting out, forced me to read books. Uh, I think he forced me. Um, and he gave me the books. He had bookcases much bigger than this in his office. And I think I was reading one week. And that just got me going. Think and Grow Rich was one of the first ones. And, you know, I didn't Love ever... that book. Love that book. It's the best. And it's like, oh, I did it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up rich. Quite the contrary. I didn't think I could ever be rich. Um and it's like, if I didn't read those books, I still would not think that th it, this is possible. Um, but other than that, you know, um, there's things probably that are ingrained in you when you're young. 
uh, by your parents, by teachers, things like that. You know, so like things like being thoughtful, um, something my dad is, you know, really uh, is a very thoughtful person. And so I take that and I apply it to work. You know, I think of, oh, the borrower said this to me. So, I, you know, after closing, I'm going to send him this really thoughtful gift or referral source or things like that. Um, and it's like I'm always going through transactions thinking, what can I do that's unexpected that's like thoughtful. Like I'm, I'm like putting myself in their shoes and trying to see how I can make the experience as, as good as possible. Cause every video has their own like little kind of edge, whether it's just like, Hey, I've bought a business. I've, I'm more of a consultative person. I know balance sheets inside and out. I'm more like the experience curator. So I just want people to come work with us and have the best possible experience. And that takes a lot of going above and beyond. I like what you said about about doing the unexpected. I think that that's really, really important in setting yourself apart. A lot of times when I'm coaching my BDOs on things to do, um, I say, you know, don't don't do this. People aren't going to respond to this because you're doing it. They're going to respond to it because other people aren't doing it. And I think that you saying that you're the uh, experience curator um, speaks to that perfectly. Yeah. Um, that's why the BDO is kind of like the X factor. Um, you know, when you, when a shop's writing their processes and procedures, it doesn't, they don't start it at the BDO's initial point of contact with a customer. That's kind of like, I would hate that if, if that was the case, cause I wouldn't be following any of them, but it's like, you get to craft how you want to do business and who you want to do business with and what types of deals you want to bring in. And, um, you know, that's something I've played around with over the years is just to see like, how can I sell without selling, you know? And, and to me, it goes with basically going through my initial process, adding as much value as I possibly can, being as smart as I could, you know, doing the work, knowing the deal inside and out. And then they just talk to you and they're like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about and he's giving me good advice. And oh, I didn't think about that. And then how are you going to go somewhere else for a half percent rate when I just gave you a taste of, you know, what could be coming down the road in, in terms of like a, essentially a consultant who, um, you don't have to pay other than the price of the financing. And that's where I'm at now. And I couldn't, I couldn't do that until I got the decade, you know, the 10,000 hours of mm -hmm. experience. But now that I have it, it feels like superpowers. It is a superpower. That's good. Good for you. What is the what is the one skill every human being should focus on and develop? And this doesn't have to do with any. It doesn't have to be SBA. It doesn't have to be BDO. I just want it in your opinion. I already got you. You already got me. It's communication. Okay. You have to be able to frame things. How you communicate it goes into how you're framing it. So. There's there's examples popping in my head, but you know I'm in the middle of wheeling and dealing here, so I don't want to blow up anything. But there's stuff that my shop will tell me that I'm like, oh, this is this is like going to be really hard to deliver the news, like if we run into some sort of issue in closing or something like that, and uh, and then I'll have to turn around to the borrower and frame it in a way where they're like, okay, that makes perfect sense. But the thing is, in SBA world, a lot of times it doesn't make perfect sense. So you kind of have to, and maybe that's a bad example, but like more like, um, like if you're saying no to someone, even it's like how you, how you say no to someone ma matters immensely. Um, I mean, you can go on and on because it goes outside of lending. It's like you're dealing with your, your spouse or significant other, your, I, I mean, I'll say kids, but like, I don't really communicate other than, you know, goo goo gaga right now, but, um, if you can just be that person to basically take it almost like a almost like a politician, but without the politician stuff. And it's like take this maybe complex idea and simplify it and communicate it and get somebody to like see it your way. I mean, that's that's a that's a really important skill. I agree with that. I think too too few people understand that we are all, all of us sell, selling something and leading people. And that sounds like what you're talking about too, that communication. All right. Very cool. All right. I got um I got kind of the uh the blockbuster here for you. Okay. 
made some phone calls, sent some emails around the this industry. Guy, going above and beyond. And, uh, and I, I reached out to, to some folks in the industry that know you. And I want to give you a list of adjectives. So it wasn't just one word responses, but I distilled it into one word response. One, I, I distilled it into adjectives. And I want to bounce those off. Of okay, so some editorial think. discretion here. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just for the sake of the podcast. Arrogant. <laughs> aloof. Stuck up. Cerebral. Creative. Polarizing. Brilliant. Cocky, successful. How do you feel about these adjectives? Um, it's really, you know, it's, it's, that's pretty, I feel one, it's like, there's two things kind of simultaneously going on. One, it's like, oh, you know, you're facing kind of like a harsh reality because not all that is positive or, or can be perceived as positive. But then I also think like, if you don't have haters, you're not doing it right. Like you can't go out there and uh, get to this level without turning some people off. Despite, I mean, if I was in a room with any of those people, I highly doubt they would feel those things. A lot of these people probably um, just see my posts, right? They don't know me. But for every um, one of those, there's 100 people that are emailing me and writing me saying, thank you so much. I had no direction as a young BDO. And, you know, thanks to your, your podcast, you know, you've really helped me figure things out. It's almost like daily I get positive feedback from it. And so uh, maybe sometimes the negative reviews rise to the top, but I shake them right off. So I'm curious of those various adjectives that were shared with me and now with you, what was left out? Why do I do this? Because I'm, I did not do this to become, you know, like a personality or, you know, I didn't even think anyone was going to like listen to it. Like, uh, I didn't think we we're going to go video, you know, I, there's a lot, but the thought behind it is help people shine a light on others. I've done 111 episodes have aired this is 112, I believe, and we have more in the chamber. And the last of many has been me interviewing others, trying to shine a light on the success of others, trying to cement in uh, you know, our, the legends of our industry's legacies. People come on this podcast, they leave, they say, oh, thanks, you know, my phone's blowing up with resumes because you know, they're the director of a shop and they, people liked what they had to, to say. People come to my events, um, they gain a lot of information from it. They, people, you know, I mean, they, they get a lot of benefits from what I'm doing and I love that. And so um, selfless and, prob and I would also say probably a uh, savior of the industry. Um, oh boy, that's, Ray, that's a bold a bold statement. That's so you're a like joke. the Jake Paul of uh, SBA lending, save I'm, boxing. No, you know what? I'm just playing into the cockiness of it all. <laughs> um, you know, because it's kind of fun. Uh, even though I, I don't really think the people that like, I think the people that really know me best know like I, I'm not really, and I don't even know what aloof means. I, I can't help you there. Yeah, I don't either. But I had to look it up to spell it. All right, man. So listen, what uh, what's the next chapter for Ray Drew look like? Okay, so I think right now we're going to keep it kind of status quo, keep doing my production, um, keep managing my team, do one side project at a time, raise my daughter, and then we'll see. I mean, nothing n nothing lasts forever. Um, I, have, I have such a just good situation where I, what I'm doing right now, it's like I'm not looking to do anything different. You know, we've built a team here that, we're so in sync, you know. Um, one of the episodes that's going to be airing is with my closer. Love her. My loan coordinator and underwriter have also been on the podcast. I feel like I can't even do this without them at this point. So this is my, um, my what I'm doing in the immediate future and until they tell me I can't anymore. But when that happens, I'm going to probably do something very big.
something that will change the industry for the better, pull our industry forward. And that's all I'm going to say for now. I like it, man. Well, so this has been a very unsexy industry until you came along. I'm going to give you, definitely give you credit for that. You made it, you made it look fun again, like it was back in the olden days when I started. So I want to thank you for that. I, that's all I have. I just wanted to say it's long overdue that we get a chance to ask you some questions and get your ideas on some of this stuff. So thank you for making the time. Thank you for letting me, allowing me to be the one to do this interview. And thank you for this Art of SBA Lending Coffee Mug. It is the nicest mug I have. You can take that with you. I was planning on it. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. You got it, bud. All right, that's it for this week. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode of The Art of SBA Lending. And if you have any feedback or suggestions, email me at ray at artofsba.com. Until next time, ta-ta.